Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara McGillivray. I'm lecturer in Digital Humanities at the um, Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. Here I'm, I'm here to welcome you to uh, Riot uh, Club. Uh, so uh, welcome if you're already a member or if you're a newcomer, you're uh, most welcome to, to join. This is um, one of the events that we run regularly, so Riot's is a self-organizing initiative that is entirely led by early stage career researchers. And we host uh, weekly seminars that aim to raise awareness and provide training in reproducible, interpretable, open and transparent science. Uh, so you can see here uh, that uh, we have uh, exciting events uh, lined up uh, after uh, today. And so do have a look and uh, you also see in the uh, in, um, uh, in, in this meeting, uh, the links to our social media uh, presence, our website, Twitter, uh, and so on. So do check those out. And um, you can also join uh, the mailing list that you can find on, on the website. So uh, before I introduce today's uh, speakers, a few notes for housekeeping. Um, so we host all our events like this one on MS Teams Live events. Uh, which generates publicly accessible link so anyone can join. So you can share this link publicly. Um, and live events is one way streaming platform. So you can ask your questions via the Q&A message board and these will be moderated and passed on to the, to the speakers at the end of the talk. So do keep your questions and comments relevant and respectful, please. And um, yes, do monitor the Q&A message board and upvote any questions that you'd like to see uh, answered. Um, great, so now on to the main event. I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce to you our two uh, speakers, Dr. Scott Merrick and Dr. Brandon Turver Clemens. Uh, Scott uh, is an instructor in psychiatry in the psychiatry department at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. His research focuses on pediatric neuroimaging, precision functional imaging of individual brains, and best practices for reproducible research. Um, he leverages very large sample size data sets to understand population level links between the brain and non-brain factors, as well as small uh, sample size data sets um, with deep uh, phenotyping to understand what makes the brain unique. His work is supported by the National Institute of Mental Health. And, that, and Brendan is a postdoctoral fellow at Massachusetts General uh, Hospital and Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on understanding the emergence of psychopathology and the substance uh, used during adolescence and uses techniques from con cognitive neuroscience, developmental psychopathology research in data science. He's engaged in methodological research aiming to evaluate and improve the reproducibility and ultimately clinical utility of large scale fMRI research in neurodevelopmental studies. His work is supported by Massachusetts General Hospital and National Institute of Non-Drug Abuse Career Development Award and an early career award from the American Psychological Foundation. So very excited to introduce and listen to um, their talk, uh, whose title is Brain-Wide Association Studies, Current Challenges and Future Directions, uh, so, um, Scott and Brandon, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Barbara. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me and see these slides and we're good to go. All right. Am I, am I good to go? Okay. We're good. All right. All right. So thank you everyone for uh, for coming to listen to this. Thank you for the invite to come uh, talk about our, our recent paper. And uh, without further ado, I will just get going. OK, so we're going to be talking uh, all about today this sort of this paper and directions forward. Um, the paper being reproducible. Green wide association studies require thousands of individuals. Um, and I just want to start out you know, by giving a shout out to the whole team. This was you know, the, the the biggest, best and greatest team effort that I've ever been a part of. Uh, Brendan and I were lucky to be the ones that spearheaded this. 
uh, but we really were, you know, standing on the shoulders of a lot of other people who put a lot of hard work into data processing, data sharing, et cetera. Um, so yeah, and then just a shout out to, to Brendan personally, we're very good friends, great collaborators, and uh, it's just awesome to do science with him every day, as well as, as the, the two senior authors, Damian Fair and Nico Dosenbach. Okay, so I think it's probably best just to start out by defining what a brain-wide association study is. Uh, basically, it's looking at uh, individual differences in uh, various brain metrics, so whether that be structural MRI or functional MRI, whether it be you know resting state or, or task state MRI, and relating that to out-of-scanner psychological phenotypes or traits, such as uh, cognition and mental health. And so it's really, you know, geared at this sort of population level variability or population neuroscience. And so there's been a high degree of inconsistency across the literature with some notable failures of uh, replication. All right, so we have two overarching goals. I'm going to be presenting basically the first one and then Brennan will come in and present on the second one. Uh, the first goal is, you know, why have we failed to make progress in, in this sort of imaging approach? Uh, and it's really what this this paper answers, I think, by and large. So what I'm going to be talking about is sort of the the challenges to these cross-sectional observational brain phenotype linkages, or again, what we call BWAS. Okay, so first uh, I'm just going to talk about what the current BWAS paradigm is, just to give you all a flavor for the type of science that we're talking about specifically. All right, so in an ideal scenario, we know there's you know somewhere around 8 billion people in the world. And ideally, if we want to know, say, how brain structure or function relates to a given phenotype, what we would do is take all 8 million or 8 billion people, put them inside of an MR scanner and measure their brain structure and or function, and then relate it to various forms of mental health or cognition, et cetera. And that would give us our you know, robust estimate of what the population effect is. Uh, however, that's obviously untenable. So what we do instead is we just you know, focus in, say, on a, a single site you know, of, say, 25 or 50 individuals. Uh, we put them in the scanner, measure brain structure and or function, and then relate it to a given phenotype. And then as scientists, you hope that, you know, your p-value is less than 0.05. It's a significant finding. It goes into the literature, uh, so on and so forth. Rinse, repeat. Uh, but with that paradigm, there's, you know, I think most researchers would say that, you know, we're in at least some form of a reproducibility uh, crisis. So in a nature poll of around 1,500 researchers, about 90% of them said that there is, you know, some form of a crisis with over half saying there's there's a significant crisis. And, you know, in terms of, of BWAS specifically, there's been attempts to improve the rigor and reproducibility of these studies. Um, so, for example, there's uh, analysis streams, so standardization of analysis streams. There's a lot of different decision points in how we process our data. And so, you know, streamlining that is is one way to hopefully improve reproducibility. Uh, another one is pre-registering of your study design and hypotheses, and then data and code sharing. Uh, but we're going to make the argument that while all those things are great and we should continue doing though and even keep doing those things and accelerate those initiatives, that may not be enough for BWAS. All right, so now uh, an explanation. So first, I just want to start off by, you know, giving a little bit of background of how we got here. Uh, this is a, a photo of Brendan when we were in Italy together cooking some pasta. Uh, so how it all started was back in late 2018, early 2019. We were invited uh, to write a paper for the journal Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience. You know, both of us are, are pediatric neuroimagers, you know, by training. And so at the time, we had around 2,000 individuals collected and processed from this big study, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study uh, in the United States, where across 21 sites, you know, we're scanning children between the ages of nine and 11. Uh, and, our, you know, the total sample size is around 12,000. At the time we had data from around 2000. And so, you know, I got on the phone with Brendan and we were talking about what some cool ideas would be. 
And, and one of them was just to associate brain function or resting state functional connectivity when someone's lying in the scanner and we're just measuring brain function at rest, just relate that to cognition. And so we could ask, you know, what is the sort of the cognitive architecture of the child brain? And, it, you know, having a sample of 2000 was going to be the biggest sample that, you know, anyone had ever done this on. And so what we did was we had our data set split up into a discovery and a replication set where we had a thousand subjects in each one. Uh, and here is like it's sort of like resting state networks plotted against each other and asterisks is where there's statistical significance. So you can just pass your eyes back and forth in this figure and you can see that, you know, in the discovery and replication set, some things replicate, um, but other things do not. And then there's some things that are not significant in the discovery set that are in the replication set and vice versa. And so this, this really puzzled us at first. It was surprising to us that things didn't reproduce as well as we thought they were going to with, with this many individuals. Um, and the, the case for relating the brain with psychopathology was even worse. The reproducibil reproducibility was very poor in only um, you know, 1,000 individuals in each sample. And it's sort of the hint as to why reproducibility was so poor was in the effect sizes. So here is just, a, we call this a brain behavior matrix. So it's just a, a representation in matrix form of how the brain relates to psychopathology. Uh, and what you can see is that, you know, this uh, color bar here is bound between zero and 0.1. So these aren't very strong effects. You're talking about, you know, explaining 1% of the variance in the data. And this is just a different representation of that, that when we look at the brain in a different way, most of the effect sizes tended to be very small, you know, really around zero. So that led us to sort of take a, you know, a zoom out, so to speak, go to like a 30,000 foot view and ask in general, well, what are the effect sizes of brain behavior association or BWAS? Uh, not just for, you know, one phenotype, but for all the phenotypes that we could explore and you know different uh, imaging modalities as well. And I think you know the, the problem is well encapsulated by Talia Arconian way back in 2009 when you know sort of you know talking about this. He said, "Truth be told, we don't conclusively know what type of effect sizes exist in the population." And I mean, we thought that this was an extremely important question to answer. You know, there's well over two million hits on Google Scholar for brain behavior relationships. This research has been done for a couple of decades and, you know, I was a little bit surprised uh, that, you know, we just didn't know what the, the basic effect sizes were. Uh, so then you can ask, OK, well, you know, why don't to this point, at least, why didn't we know what the effect sizes of, of VWAS were? Uh, and the answer to that really is that there's resource limitations on neuroimaging. It's very expensive to do. So a single investigator can only get, you know, so much grant funding to do an imaging study. And because it's expensive, there tends to be a lot of small sample studies. So this is sort of just a, like a, a small meta-analysis of the number of, of studies by sample size. And you can see that in general, neuroimaging samples tend to be very small. There's only a few that are out, you know, into the, the few hundred. Um, and then I'll get to I'll get to what these are in a little bit. Take home being though that, that that imaging studies tend to be small. And then we can see that over time as we go from right around when imaging began in the, at least MR imaging began in the, the early 90s, uh, there has been a steady increase in sample size. Uh, but you know, we're talking about an increase of an average of around 10 to maybe an average of around 25 or 30. Okay, so then we can ask why does small sample BWAS make effect size estimation difficult? And that answer lies in the concept of sampling variability, uh, which is pretty straightforward. It's just how much an effect size estimate varies between samples of the population. So I think it's it's a pretty boring concept, um, but it's it's rarely considered and it's supremely important for this type of research to, to really have a grasp on this. So I have an example here where on the y-axis we have uh, a correlation value. So you could think about this as an effect size by sample size. And what this cone represents are various studies. So independent studies, you know, run by say different labs, for example. And what types of effect sizes you would expect uh, to see in those studies. And so we can see that, you know, at small samples, 
you know, it sort of enables this wide range of, of correlations or effect sizes uh, to exist, right? You could have one study in an N of 25 where you observe a, a correlation of 0.4, another study where you observe a correlation of zero. And if you start comparing across studies, it, it really muddies things up. Uh, but the important thing to note is that as you increase sample size, sampling variability decreases because you're getting a more representative picture of the general population. Uh, importantly, if you were to just take an average across, say, say that you did, there were 100 studies of 25 individuals. If you took the average effect size across all of those studies, you would get to the population effect size or what the, the representative sample is because it, it's cumulative over all of those samples. Uh, however, uh, when we do science, when we report science, we tend to only report things that are statistically significant. And that's what's denoted by this dashed black line here. And so you'll see at small samples, what ends up happening is, is that if you observe a correlation that is the true population effect size, say of 0.15, for example, uh, it's known as the file drawer problem in science. What you tend to do is you just file it away and you don't publish it. The studies that will get published are, oops, sorry about that. The, stu the studies that will get published are the studies up here. These are the studies that are statistically significant. Um, it's a large effect. It looks believable to our brains and it goes out into the literature. So the literature becomes filled with these inflated effects rather than the true population effect size. OK, and then I just want to make the point that sampling variability is a random source of error. So this isn't, you know, something that's driven by researchers, for example. It's just it, it's a law of mathematics. It's a law of statistics. And, and increasing sample size is the only way to decrease sampling variability. So all I did here is generate two random vectors of data. So they're not related at all. You can see that the correlation is zero. But if I just take small subsamples of that data, say 25 points to correlate with one another, you can observe uh, very large positive associations or very large negative associations just by chance alone. And again, that's because sampling variability is it's a feature of all correlational analyses and it's it's a random source of error. So we hear a lot about, you know, this being a, a neuroimaging problem. It's really not a neuroimaging problem. It's it's a correlation problem. It's it's taking our imaging measures and then relating them to, to variables outside of the scanner. OK, so then why does uh, small and BWAS make effect size estimation difficult? It's because small samples have very large sampling variability. Uh, but recently there's been efforts to increase sample sizes in neuroimaging. So there's the Human Connectome Project, uh, which collected data in around 1,200 individuals. Uh, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, or ABCD study that I mentioned before, which collected data in around 12,000 individuals. And then the UK Biobank uh, going on over in Europe that uh, we have data on around 37,000 individuals and they have imaging data on even more people at this point. OK, so then the, the main question in the BWAS paper was, does the reliance on typical neuroimaging sample sizes, so around 25, provide a parsimonious explanation for the replication failures in BWAS? So in order to answer that, we have to answer what are the effect sizes of, of brain behavior correlations. Now that we have these very large data sets, we can start to answer this question. So we used a, uh, an N of around 50,000 individuals. Uh, and again, this is cross-sectional observational samples from these three data sets. Uh, we uh, ran our analyses across multiple imaging modalities. So cortical thickness, brain structure, um, and multiple levels of scale. So individual brain points, uh, regions of interest in the brain, whole brain networks, and then these spatial principal components as well. Uh, and we look at similar levels of scale for brain function or resting state functional connectivity. And then we take these imaging modalities, we apply both univariate and multivariate machine learning techniques uh, to associate uh, imaging with uh, 41 demographic cognitive and mental health individual variables. OK, so the, the the answer to the question, what are the effect sizes uh, in panel A here are effect sizes of cortical thickness with these various uh, phenotypes? And you can just see that it's, you know, a, a histogram basically of the effect sizes and the scale of that histogram is bound between negative 0.15 and 0.15. And so on the top panel is is brain structure. On the bottom panel is brain function. 
And you can see for the most part that, you know, these histograms are bound between around negative one and 0.1. So the very largest univariate effect size that we were able to replicate was an R of 0.16. And then the top 1%, so the strongest 1% of univariate brain-wide associations was an R of 0.06, so explaining less than 1% of the variance. And the median, the median across all uh, brain-wide associations that we looked at was 0.01. Okay, so then, you know, it probably can, can glean what this answer is. So what are the implication of small effect sizes and sampling variability for small sample studies? Based on what we've been through before, you know, the, the answer is the alarm bells start to go off. So to really answer what this means for replication in small samples, um, by using these large sample data sets, what we were able to do was subsample them so we could sort of simulate smaller studies. So what we did was we subsampled a thousand times at 16 different sample size bins, ranging from a typical study of 25 individuals to very large or up to 30,000. And then across those sample size bins, we were able to calculate statistical power, compare that to analytical solutions, and then also compute reproducibility across sample sizes. So we could ask for a given sample size, you know, how good should reproducibility be? All right, so first I'm just gonna point you to an example using functional connectivity or brain function with depression. So here what I have plotted is the very largest association that we could find between brain function and depression. And again, this is one of these sampling variability plots where on the y-axis we have the correlation across samples or you know, across these thousand iterations. And then on the x-axis is sample size. And this ranges from, from 25 out to 4,000 in this example. So you can see here in darker purple, this is the population estimate. So this is you know, the effect size that actually exists in the population as, as we measured it. Um, in terms of these smaller sample studies really out through several hundred, what ends up happening is that, you know, the most likely outcome is that you won't achieve statistical significance, goes into the file drawer. And again, the studies that do achieve statistical significance, these are what are going to be reported out in the literature, but they're inflated effects. So they're, you know, a, a false, um, sort of not an accurate measure of what the true effect size is. And again, this is because of this dependence on, on these smaller samples. So you can see that again, most imaging studies tend to be, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of zero to 100 or 200 individuals. And that gets you in the zone where, you know, you're pretty much guaranteed to misrepresent the true effect in some way. Uh, and then this slide here is just to make the point that, that sampling vari variability exists across all brain-wide associations. And again, it's just because it's it's a it's a feature of correlational analyses. The same could be true for behavioral studies as well. Like in one of our supplemental figures, we just plot behavioral variables against each other, and you can see sampling variability there too. Okay, so then given these effect sizes, how many people are needed to reproduce BWAS? So here, what we do is we plot statistical power uh, as a function of sample size. Now, typically in the field, we consider 80% uh, power 0.8 to be adequate. And uh, just as a refresher for people, what power is, it's the, the sample size that's required to detect a significant effect X percent of the time. So if you're statistically powered at 80%, it means for that given sample size, you'll find a true effect if it exists 80% of the time. Uh, and what we have here is plotted against a range of p-values because what your power is for a given study is, is dependent on how strict you are with control of false positives. So what we can see here is that all the way out to 4,000 individuals, uh, statistical power remains below 80%, so it never achieves adequate uh, power even at a sample of 4,000 individuals, regardless of whether you're doing a single test in the brain that requires a p-value of 0.05 or multiple tests where you're doing a Bonferroni correction, for example, at 10 to the negative seventh. Then in terms of the probability of replication, so we have the, the probability of replicating on the y-axis against sample size on the x-axis, again, for various p-values. And what you can see is that as we get out to 2,000 individuals, uh, the best we can do in terms of the probability of replicating is around 25%. 
Um, and then you, you can note you have to do a, a little bit of a transpose in your head. So 2000 is is right in here. And you can see that, for example, at like 0.05, you're around, you know, 40%, uh, 45% powered. But then your probability of replication is only 25%. So you say, well, wait, what's going on here? Why is, you know, the probability of replicating so much lower? Um, and it's because replication is the square of power. Typically, when we define replication, we say, all right, study one has a P less than 0.05. Replication means that study two also has that same effect at P less than 0.05. So it's the, said differently, it's the sample size that's required to detect a significant effect two times in a row. Um, and because it's a conditional probability, that probability is lower than what power actually is. Hopefully that makes sense. I went through that pretty quickly. Um, so then we could ask, like, you know, is this specific to ABCD? What I was showing you in those in those last couple of figures was from the ABCD data set. Um, it's multi-site, it's adolescent data. You know, so does it do those findings generalize to, you know, if we only scan people on a single scanner, or if we look at say adults, not just kids, for example? Um, and the answer to that is yes. So this is just looking at a, a histogram of the effect sizes across all of these data sets, and you can see that they're very similar. Um, in this figure here, this is pretty cool. It's taking the UK Biobank data set, which is the biggest one, calculating sampling, sampling variability across all of the brain-wide associations, and then you know, subsampling that back to a sample size of, of 25. And you can see that the, the sample size that or the, the effect sizes that you would expect to see in the smaller HCP or ABCD data set can fully be explained by the sampling variability of, of the UK Biobank. So it's really the case that these effects are, you know, a lot smaller than, than people had thought they were with what was being previously published. Um, okay, so, so goal one, just as like a recap for all of this, then I'll turn it over to Brendan. Um, why have we failed to make progress thus far? Uh, the answer is, is that previous BWAS studies with 10 or hundreds of participants have been underpowered. And so because they're underpowered, those studies tend to report inflated and irreproducible associations that then serve as the foundation for future meta and power analyses. And this is again exacerbated by publication bias by only publishing things that are P less than 0.05. So I think if there's one thing that, that you take away from this is that many previous BWAS are likely inflated effects that were brought into existence by non-intentional but systematic sampling variability. Uh, so we can't speak to any one study and say, you know, will this study replicate, for example, because we didn't actually test any one study for replication, more of a, you know, a broad conclusion. Uh, and so with that, I will stop sharing and then shoot this over to Brendan to give a more hopeful mes message of where we're going into the future. Excellent. Well, so obviously wonderful to follow Scott uh, here. Pull this up. All right, are we good, Trevor? Okay. All good. All good. All right. Well, thank you so much. And and uh, it's always good to give this talk with Scott um, because he he likes to give the front end and 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 then likes to defer the good news to me. Um. So. Uh, I, just to reiterate what Scott says, it's, it's such an honor and, and pleasure to give this talk to this group. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is spend, um, I, I recognize and, and we recognize having presented this paper a few times um, that a lot of what we're, we're speaking to can can be, uh, generates a lot of questions. And in some sense, we're asking for a full more order of magnitude, larger sample size for some of these um, types of neuroimaging analyses and studies. But what I'm going to do now is, is talk about some of the solutions that we've even already found um, in our own paper um, and some that we have forward um, just to kind of help frame any discussion or questions that people might have. Um, both thinking through BWAS, that is these association studies linking inter-individual differences in neuroimaging metrics to out-of-scanner phenotypes, as well as, of course, non-BWAS designs um, that might also inform the types of questions we, we want to answer here. So the first of these that, that might already come to mind is, is uh, has to do with measurement reliability. Um, so that is how well does a measure um, sort of track itself over time and how uh, good of an estimate are we getting either in the brain or in these phenotypes. 
Um, and there's you know, a closed form solution here um, about how reliability, of course, sets the upper bound on effect sizes that we can uh, attempt to uncover. Uh, you know, this is a classic uh, work by uh, Spearman um, in 1904. Um, and I'm going to show you some simulations using this very formula, uh, formula. But what we can say in a heuristic sense is that no measure can, of course, correlate with another measure than it correlates with itself. So what we find here and when we simulate this out, this is um, from our, our, our nature paper, um, is that the very largest brain-wide association effect sizes will indeed be helped by improved reliability. Um, so just to orient you to this figure, the y-axis here um, plots uh, potential future reliability um, and the x-axis um, plots sort of assumed current reliability. And what we can see is that for the very largest effects, that is the top 1% effect or what equates to a BWAS correlation of, of 0.0 six, um, we can expect a, a, a large improvement if we can increase reliability of both our brain um, and behavior phenotypic measures here. Um, obviously, getting reliability of one is is likely impossible due to biological limits and, and, and what we understand about measurement, um, but it does give us a sense and a direction to go. However, um, this is not sort of a, a, a fix all um, because of course the typical effect um, is, un, uh, um, is unchanged when we do these types of simulations. Um, so that is to say that we, of course, think measurement reliability will help, um, but ultimately this, this will, will kind of um, continue to require larger and larger samples, um, but will um, help us identify which phenotypes and which brain behavior pairings uh, might be the best um, to pursue with, with more detail. Um, and then obviously another one that, that might come to mind and one that is very uh, of, of our own interest and we have some work that we're um, getting ready to submit as a follow up here on this, um, is, is moving beyond simple models of, of neuroscience that link an individual brain feature um, to an individual phenotype to a more comprehensive or multivariate picture. Um, so that is using the increasingly common multivariate prediction techniques, sometimes referred to as machine learning, uh, regularized regression, um, including those that link multiple or multivariate brain features to a single uh, psych uh, psychological phenotype shown here on the left, um, or those that are even more complex that link multiple brain features um, to multiple phenotypes through a shared latent subspace. Um, and we looked at both of these um, in some detail in the manuscript, and so I would defer you there, but um, to, to cut to the chase a bit here, um, this is the single best way that we found, and, and this is consistent with some other work I'll, I'll reference, um, about how we can today um, improve the reproducibility of brain-wide association studies. So I'm showing you two specific examples here on the y-axis of these plots is an in-sample correlation, um, and this is meant to remind ourselves that these types of algorithms and these types of methods have a tendency to algorithmically overfit data in, um, in the data set that they're developed on, um, and therefore we need to replicate them in out of sample data. So we're actually going to draw our inference here on the x axis that shows the out of sample correlation, or what we might think was the out of sample effect size. The hashed line on these, on these figures shows the threshold for a, a, of a null distribution, um, suggesting a, that those dots that are on the right side of the hashed line are significant replications. And what we can see for this specific example linking resting state functional connectivity to cognitive ability um, using this multivariate method is that even for more conventional sample sizes, the red dot here um, is a sample size of 200, um, we're achieving a high degree of consistent replication um, um, with this brain phenotype pairing. Um, and we can see even for some of the smaller sample sizes, the color in this image uh, actually corresponds to the sample size used to train these models. Um, we can see we're also achieving um, uh, significant reproducibility um, with these types of methods. However, like most things in VWAS, this isn't a, a fix all because if we go to the same type of model, um, but now linking to a more complex uh, um, psychopathology metric or psychiatric symptom report, um, we can see that we still require the full sample, which in this simulation is close to 2000 uh, participants in the training um, to achieve significant reproducibility. Um, but again, we think that multivariate methods represent a real strong path forward, both in terms of current data sets, um, as well as where we might go in the future. Um, and this is particularly the case for links between functional brain and neuroimaging metrics um, and cognitive um, outcomes. 
However, we also need to be careful, and it's important to note that the very largest brain-wide association effects that we find, again, which, which um, seem to universally be linkages between functional neuroimaging um, and cognitive ability metrics or, or uh, sort of neuropsychological um, lab-based cognitive tasks, these also tend to be the most confounded by sociodemographic um, and, and, and relevant variables. And using the word confounded there in a biostatistical or epidemiological term um, to mean that when we adjust for such covariates, um, these effects further diminish. So just to highlight that on the y-axis here, I'm showing you a covariate adjusted uh, correlation estimate. And on the x-axis, I'm showing you an unadjusted correlation estimate. And the black line denotes uh, an identity line um, representing the same value for X and Y all the way up um, through the plot. And so the way to read this is that those, those dots, these are individual estimates um, from this uh, RSFC cognitive ability linkage, uh, those dots that are below the identity line show a decrease um, when we adjust for relevant sociodemographic um, covariates. And we can see that um, this disproportionately seems to affect the very largest effect, um, largest BWAS effects. So while, while multivariate methods and, and while sort of focusing on um, best case scenarios of resting state functional connectivity and cognitive ability are of course really important in terms towards improving reproducibility in this area, we also need to be mindful that those tend to be the most complex models if we think about causal inference um, or what are the variables that are really generating those predictions. Um, I also have the pleasure when Scott and I divide this divide this talk up of, of kind of putting this into a broader context. And in many ways, Scott and I are, are students and, and, and early career re researchers really reflecting our, our generation of neuroimaging and arriving on the scene of, of, of neuroscience um, sort of contemporaneously with the arrival of big data. And so the work that we're presenting to you today is in some ways just the latest in, in the past decade of work that's achieved striving towards larger and larger sample sizes in neuroimaging and arriving at similar inferences as, as this work. Um, and as proof of principle of this, even in the past several months in, in 2022, there's been a number of other papers um, from our contemporaries arriving at similar conclusions. Just to highlight a few of these, there's a paper um, that came out in Nature at about, about a month after ours that used structural neuroimaging data from over 100,000 participants um, using a wonderful example of of pooling data across consortia and, and showing exactly what our community can do when we work together, um, but highlighting some of this, again, the stark challenges we face when we when we want to seek to link these neuroimaging metrics to real world psychiatric outcomes in this case, uh, showing, for example, that even within this massively um, uh, compiled data set, uh, the sort of largest effects that we can see uh, seem to be limited to more serious neurodevelopmental disorders or serious mental illness. Uh, for example, schizophrenia shown here um, or neurological disease by way of, for example, Alzheimer's disease. Um, an analogous kind of conceptually in terms of its inference work um, that also just came out in the past month, um, excellent work. Um, showing in an autism challenge using resting state functional connectivity to predict autism, autism diagnosis. Um, in a training sample of 1,500 uh, participants, it was shown that the sort of asymptote of, of the um, ability to predict autism diagnosis uh, won't be reached until um, sample sizes grow in the training set um, until potentially 10,000 participants. So again, this is con consistent with the theme that for many of these types of designs, we need to be moving in some ways an order of magnitude larger in terms of how we think about doing these again these association studies which i'll spend some time at the end unpacking again to draw important distinctions still even more work and this is work that's a preprint it's really excellent um, but but kind of talking and theorizing in sort of computational sense of potential multifold increases expected for moving from even 100,000 to potentially a million participants when we're looking at these more complex psychological phenotypes um, that mirror many of the analyses we did um, in our uh, 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 the paper that Scott and I have been presenting. It's also important to point out that, that we are certainly standing on the shoulders of giants in our field and, and that our results um, comport well with uh, other large scale reproducibility studies that have been performed, um, as well as more theoretical and conceptual questions um, posed by, by really giants in our field um, that remind us that while um, we're in an 
um, I would argue, and I will argue at the end, probably the most exciting period of neuroimaging that, that has um, happened, um, it's still an emerging field and this is still a new technology um, and how will we um, take these wonderful insights and actually make them meaningful to, for example, patients um, and their families. I also want to just reiterate that that um, we, we can't say this enough, but that MRI and fMRI um, and all types of neuroimaging for that matter are not synonymous with brain wide association studies. Um, so that is just sort of proof of principle here on the left is an image that we included in, in our in our paper um, showing that resting state functional connectivity itself um, is highly reproducible um, and you can do it do this sort of um, about as well as perhaps you would want to or need to even with with a dozen subjects in terms of reproducing the general functional properties of the connectome and actually get near perfect replication once we include a, a sample size of about uh, 50 participants. Likewise, we should be uh, acknowledge that classical task-based fMRI that maps uh, stimuli, stimuli affective cognitive manipulations. Um, obviously, we know we can do this um, quite well in neuroimaging and so well that we have online searchable databases that, that perform automatic uh, meta-analyses um, such as neurosynth.org. So that is to say, again, that these are excellent measures that we have for understanding the brain. It's just far more complex in their ability to make predictions or again, associations with these complex psychological phenotypes. So where do, where do we go from here and what are the paths forward? Well, for these brain-wide association studies, which we've, we've tried to really be careful to define um, at every chance that we get, um, we think that large sample sizes and likely multivariate methods are going to be necessary to improve reproducibility and inference in this area. Um, we should also note, and in, in, as I showed you some simulations, methods development and reliability improvements for both neuroimaging, such as excellent multiband, multi-echo sequences um, that we think and, and others have shown are, will increase measurement and reliability, um, as well as increase reliability in phenotypic variables. You know, we, uh, Scott's intro talked about deep phenotyping, other types of passive sensing, ambulatory assessment, um, smartphone assessment. All of these have a role to play in, in improving this literature and, and clearly improving the methods through which we make these measurements will, will improve our linkages um, between them. Again, and, and kind of consistent with our view of how we understand these types of studies and the goal of brain-wide association um, studies or BWAS, following in the model of, of um, genome-wide association studies or GWAS, we would argue that data sharing and aggregation have never been more important and want to point to large-scale initiatives that, that are making this um, easier and easier for our field to do. And so um, each one of these represents a, an important step forward. Um, and here in the United States, the National Institutes of Health is, 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 is accelerating this initiative um, by requiring mandatory data sharing policies to be um, uh, detailed in future grant submissions. So I, I think we're entering a stage where more and more data will be available to us to increase our sample sizes to be able to ask these questions with the fidelity and the reproducibility that we want. We would also argue, and, and perhaps Scott and I are admittedly biased here, that we think that more neuroimaging psychometric and reproducibility studies should, of course, be done. And as, as a note of this, the three primary data sets here that we discussed are all publicly available um, pending um, proper data use agreements. And, and um, as early career researchers interested in improving this science, we are looking for collaborators um, of all scales um, to, to, to help us in, in these endeavors and would be excited to collaborate with anyone who might be interested. Um, it, just to kind of put a specific plug, um, we have a preprint um, here, Scott's, uh, um, Scott and I, that we've done with, um, that we uh, helped uh, curate with our colleagues at the University of Minnesota, led by um, Damian Fair and Eric Fesco, um, that details the pre-processed data, the matched replication sets, and some of the analysis streams that we use for our Nature paper, as well as a few others that we and other, um, other groups have used with this ABC data um, that you can find on BioArchive. And then I also want to take a second as, as I'm, a, I'm a clinician scientist, I see patients 
um, as, a, as a therapist, um, adolescent patients um, with substance use disorders and, and mental health disorders. And so part of BWAS is, is, I think, I know important for the entirety of the endeavor of, of cognitive neuroscience, but it's particularly important in my own area uh, of clinical neuroscience, given that so much of, of what we think about are these complex psychological phenotypes. And so I want to make the analogy that just as MRI and fMRI are not synonymous with uh, brain-wide association studies, as is, um, so too is brain-wide association studies, they're not synonymous with all of translational neuroimaging or all of the ways we might hope to uncover sort of neural patterns representative and important to mental health. Um, and so, you know, for lack of a better word, or I guess, I guess to kind of keep it vague at first, one of the ways we can think about that is measuring similar stuff, but with new and improved research designs. Um, and one of the things that we often think about um, in our collaborations my, you know, between Harvard and WashU, as well as broader people that, that we network with, is, is the real goal of complementing brain-wide association studies or these observational cross-sectional designs with real precision longitudinal pieces. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk a bit about patient-oriented designs, um, but there's obviously analog um, analogous designs that have to do with more basic science questions and basic cognitive neuroscience as well. So obviously some of these we, we've set up and, and taken care to, to say that really part of the, 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 the fundamental challenge of brain-wide association studies is their cross-sectional correlational nature. So obviously we think that longitudinal brain behavior linkages, even within observational designs, will be important towards improving translational neuroimaging markers. And in some ways we know mathematically that this has to be the case. We talked about measurement reliability being important as we scale up longitudinal measurements um, that will at least dr drive down measurement error on our average estimates or individual differences. Um, so that will be important. We have a number of studies in the United States, ABCD being one of them, um, that will collect longitudinal data and hopefully help us improve our inferences. Um, in kind of mirroring that in a different sense, and you know, we talked about BWAS as being uh, uh, observational. We think that studies with induced effects are, are, are really part and parcel to, to improving these types of translational inferences that we might want to make. Um, I mentioned task-based fMRI, um, which does have, uh, is more challenging to link to an individual patient's or participant's mental health or, or psychological phenotypes. But of course, this gives us fantastic insight into the neural markers um, that are underlying um, behavior um, on average across participants. Um, we can also highlight lesion studies, um, and there's been fantastic, you know, as lesion studies is kind of the oldest way we, we've thought about brain behavior relationships. Um, and there's been just truly incredible work over the past decade thinking of how to integrate lesion mapping um, across multiple data sets with, for example, network neuroscience. Um, we also think of integrating um, across these different types of designs. And one that's my own interest is, is integrating longitudinal studies with induced effects or in the context of interventions. Um, so integrating scanning into, into other ways that we might influence brain and behavior um, as, as, as something that um, is, is really important. And part of what I'm drawing here is, is perhaps, you know, even, even better summarized by an excellent commentary um, by Katarina Gratton, Steve Nelson, and Evan Gordon that came out um, uh, commenting on our own paper in Nature that came out in Neuron about a month ago, highlighting that neuroimaging in many ways is at a nexus of, of two important um, paths forward in terms of improving um, fMRI and MRI brain behavior linkage, linkages. And on one path is this large sample size consortium studies um, which we think are so essential for measuring population variability, improving our inferences in these types of BWAS analyses, um, but that need not um, make uh, obscure the fact that there's an extremely important alternative path um, that I'll argue here in a second is actually fully complementary, um, but of, of more high uh, signal to noise is how they oriented this, um, but focused longitudinal studies um, with more experimenter um, control. And I think to, to kind of zoom out all the way and to kind of show some of my cards again as a clinician, I think what we, we, we often want to do with BWAS um, can be um, better improved by, by understanding what are the, the long-term translational goals of this type of neuroimaging when we're trying to understand mental health and cognitive phenotypes. 
And you know, to, to put this a little bit in perspective, we can see this one, one path forward of large sample sizes as perhaps being really relevant if we want to confirm diagnoses of, of mental health or to understand, um, you know, confirm a clinician report, um, or better yet, have a prognostic marker um, that can perhaps predict which among an existing uh, suite of evidence-based treatments um, might be better suited for a particular person or a particular patient. Um, but also, also that it, it's important to understand that, that neuroscience is, of course, um, uh, one of discovery and, and that to identify new mechanisms and to set up new treatments, we need to also be thinking about smaller longitudinal um, and intervention studies with, with um, excellent experimental control that can ultimately help us understand symptom processes and targets for new interventions um, in the long run. And so what this suggests is that, that, again, for the very first time in neuroimaging, and which is why Scott and I would both argue, I know, that this is probably the coolest and most important time to be doing this type of work, is that both of these paths forward um, finally um, have, have legs in terms of um, being able to um, achieve each type of neuroimaging um, with high fidelity. Um, so for that, um, I'm going to end and be happy to take questions um, um, from the audience. Great, thank you both. Uh, and thank you for uh, sticking to the time. So we got a few questions. I'll uh, I'll read them out uh, to you now. Um, so the, the, the first one is, um, would collating data from different sites across similar enough paradigms, uh, for example, resting state, help to address small sample sizes of individual studies? If yes, how can we account for the differences arising from different scanners or, or acquisition parameters? You want to so, take that, Scott? Yeah, I'll, I'll at least start you, then you can you can add to it. The answer is yes. I think that would that would help a lot. That's definitely one of our ways forward is in data sharing. And so obviously we're big fans of depositing it in public repositories, but also, you know, if it's like a multi-PI sort of thing where you're you know, sharing data with other collaborators across labs to pull your samples to be, you know, larger than than what they can be in a single lab. I think that would be really great in terms of, you know, how you can do that across scanners. Um, I mean, there there's some methods that are developed now and that are continually being developed like combat for for harmonization across scanners. And some of that was done for the ABCD study because it was, you know, a, a multi site uh, I think it's multi-site and multi-scanner. We have, you know, Siemens, GE, Philips, all different types of scanners that had to be harmonized across. Um, so yeah, my answer is yes. I absolutely think that that that's an awesome way forward. Yeah, and I think I think I guess to to mirror kind of my call to action that that's still to just highlight an empirical question and actually. Uh, we didn't talk about it today, but um, Scott and my first paper together looked at that quite a bit and um, the scanner manufacturer differences and indeed those effects are there. Um, so I think it's it's we should proceed um, with with um, pushing forward with those types of studies, but also be open to and, and seeking out collaborations to test those questions directly. Um, does this undermine the inference that I want to make um, and, and how might we um, seek to ameliorate it if it does? Yeah, I think just one final thought on it. I certainly think in the case of, of you know, the BWAS study design, I think sample size is the most important factor. Um, so th though, yes, there are scanner differences that are that are quite large and, and things like that, I do think trying to get as large of an end as possible uh, will behoove the field. Thank you. Uh, so I'll ask this the other question. Um, let's see. Do you have any suggestions for best practices for power calculations for imaging studies? This is something that comes up often. And a lot of people tend to default to the Sirian et al. 2007 paper, suggesting at least 50 20 participants. But it seems like it, this is quite a simplistic approach and not tailored to individual studies and paradigms. Would love to hear your thoughts. I will say that I think one of uh, both the best and worst parts about neuroimaging is that it is extremely versatile. You can use it for a lot of different types of study designs, which I think will will be great for us going forward. 
I do think, you know, like an N of 20, depends what your task contrast is. I mean, like that paper in particular is about, you know, task-based fMRI if you want to, you know, induce an effect and measure it of where it is localized in the brain. Um, certainly, you know, that type of, of recommendation or prescription would not suffice anymore for, for BWAS. Um, yeah, thoughts you want to add to that, Brendan? Just, you know, I guess I guess as, as, as serving some of this role in my own institution and in my own collaborative network, I think speaking with um, our colleagues that that um, in, in, in tackling these questions and, and as a team is important. Um, and, you know, the sort of the best power analyses are matching the target goal with evidence that's aligned to that. And so, um, you know, just as if we think outside of neuroimaging, if we want to understand um, a cognitive outcome, we should be basing our power analyses on cognitive outcomes instead of mental health outcomes. Um, so too, in terms of aligning our power analyses to those. Um, I think um, the good news is in terms of grant structure and, and, and thinking through those, um, open data and open sharing and which is why we were so excited to give this talk will make this much easier now that there are better examples that exist in the literature one of the challenges with with these types of studies when i talk to my um, quantitative colleagues in other fields is that neuroimaging for a very long time has relied on 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 very sparse representation of statistical results and only sharing those results that that exceed some um, fairly stringent multiple comparison correction. And so um, that can make um, power analyses tough if the, the region of the brain or your inference point um, is not in that particular map. But I think as we, um, as a field, um, dive into sharing our data and with um, more fidelity, those even power analyses will be easier to perform. Thank you. Um, another question, very interesting outline of the importance of increasing sample sizes to increase power. However, increasing sample sizes alone may not solve this issue if the sample isn't representative of the population, for example, research on Western educated industrialized rich and democratic populations. What are also um, your thoughts on how the makeup of the sample that you used in this analysis may have influenced your findings? Brennan, I'll let you take this one because I know you love to talk about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is 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 the, one of the most important questions that we have for this paper and for the state of neuroimaging at, at writ large. For for these types of studies to be relevant to real world people, patients, and their families, they need to be representative of who those real world people are. And this question points to structural problems in research um, that 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 have. In not are not unique to neuroscience, but are true in psychology and, and, and medicine um, more broadly, that we need to be improving the representation of the population. Um, I have a few thoughts. I, I would say that, um, you know, in part, that's why we're such a big fan of, of larger sample sizes. Um, in a sense, to, to achieve a larger sample size, um, that there's a practicality there that it involves teaming up with multiple sites, um, often, which by definition will at least increase some sense of geographic representation. Um, typically, um, that makes things a little bit more generalizable. Um, I can tell you that I, perhaps I can come back and, and give you some updates. Um, I am collaborating with a number of people here at the School of Public Health at Harvard. We're very interested in applying uh, uh, sort of analog analogies to epidemiological stratification weights to neuroimaging data to try to make them more representative of the population. Um, but I guess in many cases uh, that fits with my call to action on, on join us and, and help to answer those questions. Um, I know, for instance, that, that um, there's a number of initiatives within each of these consortiums to think through that, um, but, I, but I unfortunately don't have a, a solid answer um, to that. Um, but I, I just want to say that I think that is probably the most important question we should be asking um, in these types of studies. Yeah, and I think like, you know, just to sort of uh, put an empirical angle to that, you know, we often see it's the case and, you know, just because we're working with this data now that, you know, you can you can you can train a multivariate model on, for example, HCP data. Now it has a thousand individuals in it, but, you know, it's from a specific region of the United States that, you know, won't necessarily generalize well to a new data set. Um, so even though you can you can train and test really well on that data set, it won't necessarily generalize, you know, to a to a brand new, never before seen data set. So yeah, I think it's like that that might be the most the most important thing in addition to 
you know, obviously increasing sample sizes to make sure that those samples are more representative than what they have been in the past. Great, I have a few more questions. Um, is it worth publishing null results from neuroimaging studies if they're likely driven by the small sample size? Absolutely, 100%. We need to be doing this. This is, I think, more important than in many other fields um, now that we know the power piece. And what I would say is publishing null results and and uh, request me as a reviewer if you're if you're hoping to do that. And I'm happy to argue with editors on that behalf. I think that's step one because that's still the system that we have. I think perhaps it is a yes and what we want to do is also deposit our data into, into repositories. I know that sharing um, data, even summary data varies across institutions, um, but that will allow people um, that are interested in methodology, perhaps like me and, and other quantitative people, to use your data in a meta-analysis so that we can improve our inferences. So this is a this is a collaborative endeavor, and even our 20 participants that we happen to collect, if we don't find the effect that we're looking for, those will be useful for to, to our field if we can pool and share data. Yeah, and, and there's certainly, and you know, I, I alluded to this at the end of, of goal one, you know, there is a systematic, there's a structural problem in academia here that that absolutely needs to stop. And it and it's both with funding agencies and with journals of only publishing, you know, or only caring about, you know, something that is statistically significant. Because as we showed, if you're using an underpowered sample, that's, you know, it's not accurate. It's just not accurate science to only focus on that. So that it absolutely, yeah, all results should be published. <laughs> Great. And so there are two more questions. Um, so we were actually um, reached the end of the talk, but um, of the time. But um, if you could reply really quickly and sure. really quickly. Um, so this one says um, resting state paradigms are often focused on when pooling data across sites. Uh, but they have actually been shown to have quite poor test test reliability. Interested class correlation coefficients around 0 0.4, 0 0.6. What are your suggestions for improving reliability of resting state? So I think there's uh, there's there's two ways forward there. Some of some of which we've shown. So it, as part of um, I was a postdoc with Nico Dosenbach, and some of what was shown in his lab and and in some data sets previous is that. Uh, time spent in the scanner improves reliability. So the more imaging data, the more resting state data you collect within an individual, the better the reliability. So similar to, to BWAS with like, okay, well, how do you improve reproducibility? It's get a larger sample. How do you improve reliability of the imaging measures to measure for a longer time? You get a more accurate representation of the individual that way. But then as Brendan mentioned too, there's other methodological improvements that are that are happening right now that we're really optimistic about. And one of those being multi echo sequences that seem to do uh, better in terms of reliability for a given unit time than than single echo sequences. So I think that the combination of methodological improvements like uh, multi echo sequencing and, and acquiring, you know, larger amounts of data within an individual will help. Great. And the final um, question, brilliant talk, thank you. Different labs often use different acquisition protocols and processing pipelines, which often make it difficult to pull data together. Can you talk about some of the challenges and how you accounted for them in your work? Quickly. <laughs> yeah, so, so some of the challenges uh, that we accounted for were, uh, was by um, essentially maxing out every supercomputer we could find um, to, to pre-process tens of thousands of data sets. And we recognize, of course, that that is not always tenable for individual investigators. Um, but I think the model that, that we've adopted in, in mine and Scott's collaboration um, is, is to is to um, try to, again, in the, in the spirit of team science. And so I, I link to that preprint um, where there's pre-processed data that's um, sort of consistent with the way that we use it. Um, we publish our accession codes for individual participants. And I think the goal should be that we, we as neuroscientists or psychologists or whoever are the end users um, do the best that we can to collaborate with engineers on our campus um, and, and other groups um, and to really put our put our heads together in terms of how to do that. So I think the future of BWAS is to is to have um, sort of uh, is to uh, harmonize those efforts um, and to take the burden off an individual investigator because obviously as we scale up data sets, 
um, you know, the processing time of, of pre-processing 30,000 data sets on a single investigator's even, you know, small server um, it becomes untenable. You'd be working on that data for a couple of years um, to achieve that. Great. Uh, so yes, thank you so much for your talk and for answering all the questions. And thank you to the audience for uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. So we end the event here, but do check uh, all the uh, the uh, links that were shared, website and social media for the next uh, talks. See you around. Yeah, thank Thanks. you very much for having us. We always have fun with it.